Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in for today's bite size talk. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking our funders, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, for supporting all NF Core events. So, just some preliminary information this talk is being recorded, and the video will be uploaded on YouTube and shared on Slack and on our website. The talk will be about 15 minutes, after which we will have a QA session where you feel, you feel free to send your question in the chat box where it will be picked up from there or unmute yourself and ask your question. Today, uh, we'll be having Hashil Patel, the head of scientific development at Sikera Labs, who will be presenting to us about the NFCO RNA-seq pipeline, which is a bioinformatics pipeline used to analyze RNA sequencing data obtained from organisms with a reference genome and annotation. Over to you, Hashil. Thanks, Simeon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining um, what is the 32nd bite-sized talk um, of this awesome series. Uh, so I'm Harshal Patel. I am Head of Scientific Development at Secura Labs. Uh, I'm also one of the long-term contributors to NF Core. Um, and various other pipelines that we have on NFCore. Uh, if you want to know more about me, there's a link here. Um, just click on that. It's a blog I wrote recently when I joined Secure Labs. Um, so, um, jumping directly into some numbers. Um, so this pipeline is, is one of the oldest and most popular pipelines on NFCore. Um, it, it, I mean, the, the numbers are just staggering and, and they always surprise me um, when I when I see them. So, you know, we've got 400 forks, um, you know, almost 60 contributors. Uh, it's also almost 700 people on Slack. Um, and it's also one of the most active channels on Slack where people are reaching out for help and um, and coming to join to, you know, ask questions um, and also just as a forum to discuss um, the pipeline as well. Um, and so over the years, this is this has really been one of you know one of the main pipelines that we've we've had on um, on NFCore, and uh, I would say that a lot of this um, has really been possible as a result of the testament of you know the testament to Nextflow itself, um, which is the underlying language that we're using. Um, it's it's just allowed us to get you know have access to communities, infrastructures, and other stuff um, uh, that, that we wouldn't normally be able to do with a, with a pipeline like this. Um, so the pipeline itself um, has gone through various releases now over the years. Um, as I mentioned, Phil from NGI initially pushed this when you know when when NFCore was first starting up and stuff, and it was one of the main pipelines that, that um, he pushed here. And then it went through various situations of updates and Alex got involved, Alex Peltzer got involved um, in between for a while. Um, and then there was a sort of a gap for, for about a year where, the, where you know, we, we really needed, someone needed to sit down and update the pipeline. And so um, that's kind of where I got involved mainly in, in helping out with the, with the implementation of the pipeline. And um, so, before uh, up to 1.4.2, the pipeline was written in Nextflow DSL1. And then some of you may know that Nextflow has now a new DSL2. It's a more modular language. And so for us, I think that was the perfect opportunity to basically start from scratch, right, rewrite this pipeline um, essentially from scratch in DSL2 to allow us to have a proof of concept as to how it would work um, on NF Core, because obviously we want other pipelines to adopt similar um, syntaxes and principles. And so I went about um, uh, coming up with the first iteration of DSL2 at that point, um, and we released version 2.0. Um, and since then, we've we've now changed and adopted the way that we're using DSL2, partly due to um, updates. Um, Mahesh uh, helped out with, with, let's say, what is the second iteration of DSL2 that we've now got on NF Core. Um, and so that, that's, again, it's, it's constantly improving. Uh, it's, it's being adopted more and more across um, uh, NF Core. And you'll be able to see basically that in, in version 3.5. So this pipeline has really become um, the cutting edge or the gold standard in terms of what we're doing with Nextflow um, implementations. Um, uh, in terms of the RNA-seq itself, um, it's probably one of the most popular applications of next generation sequencing. Um, and uh, most people um, doing experiments uh, will, will have come across some sort of RNA-seq data, I imagine, uh, especially by petitions. And, and what you're doing is you are quantifying the expression of genes 
uh, in, in a genome at a given time. Um, and this is typical of say bulk RNA seq sequencing. Um, and you then want to get quantification of what your genes are, you know, what, what the expression of your genes are like in one condition compared to another, and then figure out what is different and try and put that in some sort of functional context, like looking at pathways or, um, or, or doing further experiments um, to figure out, you know, how expression is impacting functionally um, what you are doing or how you're perturbing the cells. And so a typical pipeline for this would be you have your reads, you, you do some cleaning of these reads by removing adapters and stuff that you get off the sequencing technologies, do some sort of QC. Um, in this case, we don't actually have this bit in the pipeline, um, but it's probably something we may add later. I'm still thinking about how to do this properly, but this, this bit here allows you to sample reads and essentially automatically infer strand specificity and then plug that directly into alignment algorithms which need this information. Uh, so yeah, so you, you would do some cleaning um, and then you would map to the, uh, to the transcriptome um, and then you can get some QC out from your um, genome BAM files as well, like um, looking for you know, intronic rates or um, genomic contamination and all sorts of that, all sorts of other you know, really useful QC metrics from, from your genome alignments. Um, but most importantly, you also get the gene counts out. And this is um, essentially a matrix uh, where you have genes in rows and samples in columns. Uh, and then that allows you to plug in these counts that you get from, from these tools like RSEM or SAMIN or, or other um, quantification methods um, in order to do the differential expression between um, the, the conditions that you have in your experiment. Um, this pipeline doesn't perform any differential expression analysis, and that's intentional because um, when you start in getting involved with stats, that's generally when things start getting complicated. And so um, differential, differential expression, in order to do it properly, you need to factor in all of the various experimental factors you have in your experiment. Um, and you can't, there's not really a standardized way of encoding that information. Um, and so to keep things simple, we, we basically have the rna seq pipeline, which gets you to the counts, and then it's up to you how you factor in various sample um, conditions, like whether you have you need to factor in the sex of, of say mice, or whether you've, um, you need to factor in time points in terms of days and, and how this would in, in affect the differential expression and other confounding factors that really need to be um, taken into account. If you wanna get an idea of some of the, the more um, low level type mapping type stuff, um, Reagan gave a great talk last week about the dual rna seq pipeline, where he explained some of this um, uh, mapping, to, mapping to various um, aspects of, of, of the genome or the transcriptome and, and, and the complications that arise as a result of that. So I won't go into much detail there. In terms of features, the pipeline, I mean, one of the, one of the biggest strengths of this pipeline is the fact that this, it's used so widely. And so, you know, we've got bug fixes, we've got feature requests, we've got contrib contributors coming from all over the world. Um, it's used on various infrastructures and clouds, which again is testament to NextFlow itself. Um, and also on various types of input data, small data, large data, medium-sized data, whatever you can imagine type data. Um, and so that's, that's really one of the biggest strengths of this pipeline. The, in terms of the alignment and quantification routes, we've got three standard ones. We've got STAR and SALMON, which Rob Petro actually helped me add, um, which is really nice of him to, to, to come. He's on NF4 Slack, and um, we basically went back and forth a bit before I added this functionality. But SALMON, as it may not be as widely known, but it also has the ability to take BAM files and quantify from those. And that's the route that we used um, for the default option in this pipeline. Uh, similarly, there's a STAR and RSEM route. Um, RSEM is touted to be one of the most accurate quantification methods. And, and in, in recent releases, I've really tried to push making this pipeline as, as accurate as possible um, to make it a gold standard best practice type pipeline. Um, and so we've, we've kind of stripped out some of the stuff like feature counts quantification, which doesn't really look at um, um, have any sort of statistical way of modeling, um, you know, where a read count belongs to, for example. And so there is no feature, feature counts quantification in this pipeline anymore which is why actually HiSAT, you don't have any downstream quantification at the moment um, because there isn't an appropriate way to project the reads um, or the counts onto a transcriptome somehow and then do the quantification, which tend to be the more accurate methods. We also have a pseudo alignment route. So these, these routes basically skip the BAM file, essentially they go from a FASTQ file and they have this quasi mapping approach where you get you use k-mers to, to, to then calculate the counts directly from the transcriptome. And so you skip the BAM file. 
Um, I guess one of the downsides of that is that you don't really, it doesn't allow you to get QC of, of things like genomic contamination and stuff, which you would you would need a BAM file for. And that's why the, the major alignment groups at the top here are probably nicer, but there's nothing to say you can't run this and also run this. Um, you can, it's up to you how you run the pipeline. There's an open request for Callisto as well, if anyone, if anyone wants to help out with that. Um, the pipelines runs from bacterial genomes, I've known to, to all the way to plant genomes, which have ridiculous amounts of duplication. So again, it's, it, it, it supports most genomes. Um, there's an inbuilt strand specificity check, which allows you to um, double check um, the strand specificity that you've used. This is quite important in RNA-seq because if you get that wrong, then your quantification will be completely wrong because you're counting reads mapping to the wrong strand essentially. Um, and so there's a warning that currently generated that, um, that tells you whether you've got it right or wrong. And a whole bunch of other features like UMI support, RNA removal, genomic contaminant removal I did recently. Um, and also you can, you can um, chain this, the, the NFCore Fetch and GS pipeline, which is another pipeline that I've written that allows you to download data just from a set of IDs, SRE IDs, and it generates a sample sheet that you can directly plug into this pipeline. So um, yeah, various, various cool features. Um, the sample sheet is quite simple. You've got sample, plus U1, plus U2, and strandedness. If you, if you have single end data, you just literally leave out or leave this second column blank and that's it. Um, and then you have strandedness um, to, to then, as I mentioned, which is quite important for the, the quantification. There's nothing complicated there. Um, in terms of reference genome options, you only need a FASTA and a GTF or a GFF. If you provide a GFF, this is converted to G GTF for, for the downstream steps. Um, but if you don't provide any, you can also provide indices and stuff to save you having to create them whilst you're running the pipeline. If you don't, then these are automatically created um, uh, throughout the course of the pipeline. Um, there's various parameter docs as well. All of these links work, by the way. I'll make these slides available so you can, you can use them as you go. Um, genomes, we're looking to move to RefGeni, but the genomes at the moment, uh, we're using Illumina AWSI genomes. It's a standard organization, it's really nice, but it's becoming quite outdated, so we'll be shifting to, to genomes and um, to RefGeni hopefully soon. Uh, the results for full-size tests are available on the website. Um, what's awesome about this is that you literally can run a proper full-size um, experiment with just two parameters. You just need to provide a sample sheet with your samples and the genome and the pipeline will, will literally generate all of the downstream steps for you. This is available on the website for you to browse. I won't go into much detail here. Similarly, there's, there's a bunch of output docs, quite extensive docs about the, uh, the, the outputs of the pipeline and some, some really nice QC plots and stuff that you can have a look at. We're always looking for feedback if we need to improve that. Um, the implementation is Nextflow native. It's all DSL2, um, one process for each process that we have. We have one biocontainer, and this really is quite modular and it allows us to update and, and, and um, maintain the pipeline a lot easier because each process um, is essentially its own dependency. Um, uh, NFCore modules, you know, 38 of the modules in this pipeline out of 55 are on NFCore modules. So again, it allows us to contribute back to this NFCore modules repository we've created, which is a central repository to host um, Nextro, essentially Nextro wrapper scripts for um, any NFCore pipeline. And there's, there's a massive toolkit and stuff that we've built around all of this to, to actually help with maintaining um, uh, modules and adding them to pipelines. In terms of configuration, one of the most commonly asked questions now with this new um, syntax is how do I change the process requirements, say? Um, so I've just put some examples down here, but the first thing you would need to do is look in your modules config for the process you want to change. Use exactly the name that is specified in this modules config, um, because it's quite important that um, you use that. It's as a, because you can have multiple processes with the same name used in the same pipeline if you're using sub workflows and stuff. And so the logic to select exactly the right process will be already defined in this modules config. So find the process you want to uh, name you want to use. In this case, it's just this that I've copied and pasted out here. And then you can append the arguments as you want. Um, as long as they're non-mandatory, you can append. So here, I just want to add this quality 20 argument. And so I've created a small config file with these options that will only change the options for this particular process. Similarly, I can change resource requirements if I want, or I can change a container, which is less likely because you want to use the containers ship with the pipeline. But if you do, then that's also possible there. 
Um, differential analysis, uh, as I mentioned before, you get all of the all sorts of counts out that you can use for downstream analysis. The pipeline doesn't do any serious differential analysis. It just generates some basic QC plots with um, for PCAs and, and heat maps that you can use to, to, to straight away figure out how your samples look. But it doesn't actually factor in any sample or experimental information, which you need to take care of downstream. And we're, we're really looking for someone that can give us this sort of talk because it's one of the most commonly asked questions on it for actually. Um, as to you know what you're doing with the downstream results of this pipeline um, and it'd be an awesome um, bite-sized talk to give actually. Um, I've also added this pipeline to Nextflow Tower, um, so Secura Labs, um, which is the home of Nextflow now, and also this, um, this product called Nextflow Tower, which um, is, is just an awesome sort of um, way of monitoring and maintaining and administering um, your Nextflow pipeline um, executions. And we're, we're really working hard with the NF4 community um, as well to try and make this even better. And so there's a community showcase area, the link's here, um, that you can join and get 100 free hours of credits to, um, to run this pipeline on, um, on Explo Tower, amongst others as well, um, to show you, you know, to give you a flavor as to what we're doing there. Um, if you want to come and chat with us, you can find us on Slack and create issues or pull requests on GitHub, um, on Twitter, and, and all of these videos and other content is available on YouTube as well. So. Thank you for your time um, and thank you everyone in the Nextflow community and the NF4 community, um, by containers and by and the great infrastructure that they've um, allowed us um, to use uh, without reinventing the wheel. And also my, my awesome colleagues at, um, at Secura Labs. Um, and also, I guess some of the main contributors to this pipe, to this pipeline in particular as well, like Mahesh, Gregor, um, Jose, Phil, who first started it off, um, and, and Alex in between, um, and everyone else um, that has contributed over time. We have a hackathon coming up. Uh, if you don't know already, here's a sign-up link I'll, I'll put in the slides, but you can find it on the website as well. Um, the major theme is documentation. If you think we're, need, we need to, we're missing anything, please come and tell us, and we will try and, um, and improve documentation wherever we can. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hashel, for that comprehensive review of the Arenisic pipeline. I feel free to ask questions if you have any. Uh, Philip, Philip actually had a question. Um, he just wanted clarification on whether we are lying to the genome in this pipeline, not to the transcriptome. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, it, it depends when how you want to look at it. Um, so actually, we do align to the genome, you're right. Um, but we project those reads onto the transcriptome. So we also get, so for example, with RSEM, what you end up doing is you get this RSEM, uh, you get this transcriptome BAM as well as a, a genome BAM. And the genome BAM is generally what you use for the QC. Um, and the transcriptome BAM is then what RSEM uses to, um, to generate the counts. So strictly speaking, yes, we're probably aligning to the genome and then somehow filtering down to, to then uh, use the transcriptome. Um, that's quite an old slide. Slide. I, I hope no one will notice, but um, yeah, so mm -hmm. um, eyes. Okay, and in order of priority of questions, could you clarify how references are built? Do you need a foster file? Uh, yes. So um, you would need your genome faster. Uh, and you would need some sort of annotation. So this pipeline doesn't do any de novo guided stuff um, or de novo, or it doesn't map, let's say it doesn't use just the transcriptome faster as an input. So if you have a novel species that you've just done um, analysis on and you've got a transcriptome, but you don't have a proper annotation, this pipeline won't work yet. I and mean, there's an open feature for that. Um, so what the pipeline essentially does is you've got your genome faster, you've got your, um, your GTF or your annotation, um, and you extract the transcriptome uh, from those two and, and use that for all of the downstream analysis. And any indices and any other information is then built from just the FASTA and the GTF. And another question from Philip, he asks who is Rob Patro? Uh, so Rob Patro is the, um, the main uh, author and developer of Salmon and, and a bunch of really other cool tools that are used not only in bulk RNA-seq, but also now in single um, cell RNA-seq. Um, for, for analysis. Okay, um, we have another question from Michael who asks, is it worth considering an R environment with a pre-built DTS object containing all the samples run? 
sorry, I didn't understand that. Does, does the pipeline generate a DDS object? Yeah, like whether it, maybe it will be worth uh, considering an R environment within the pipeline with the previous DDS object containing all the samples. Uh, so we, there is a DDS object, I believe, that is generated at the end of the pi uh, pipeline for the counts and all of that sort of information. It's a way that you can easily load stuff into your own R environment, but things start getting tricky um, and, and then become, start verging on, on actually having downstream type analysis like um, Jupyter Notebooks and all sorts of other in Studio type stuff where you then need to take the results of this pipeline um, and, and load them into a more interactive environment. It's something that we've been talking about for quite a while, actually, but um, it's it's not a trivial thing to figure out, especially when you want to factor in reproducibility and other things and, and how to do that in a standardized way. Um, it's an interesting question. So at the moment, we don't have anything that does it explicitly, um, but we do generate the DDS file that you can load into your own in our environment and do whatever you want with that um, in terms of the downstream analysis. Okay. So I think you alluded to this before, but Ramon asks how difficult is it to do conversion from DCL1 to DCL2? Um, so for this pipeline, it was actually very tricky because it was uh, it was the first adoption of DSL2 and NF core. Um, and so everything was starting from scratch and I had to basically change things about a gazillion times to actually get to where I wanted to in terms of functionality, testing and so on. Um, but now um, with the awesome infrastructure, we've built as a result of various people's learnings over the past year or so. Um, we can now really easily install modules. We can, uh, we've got some really good examples of how to write DSL2 pipelines. I gave a talk about that recently as well, um, how easy that would be and, and how you should attempt to tackle it. Um, we can link to that. If you follow up on the Bite Size channel, I can send you a link to that. Um, yeah, it all depends, again, I guess, on the complexity of your pipeline. But in theory, it should be a lot easier for you than it was for me a year ago. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for that answer. And Oliver has a bit of a comment and a question. So he says, great talk, the QC metrics are awesome. Something that will be super helpful for plotting and interrogating QC metrics will be to add the QC results as columns for each row sample, in this case, in the input sample sheet.csv. So could the columns in general statistics, multi-QC reportable be added to the sample sheet CSV? And he gave an example of how it's done with Tidyverse so now. Uh, I mean, if you have suggestions as to how we can improve it, uh, we have something similar actually that we've recently just added for Viorecon that I, I released last week. Um, and that's used for like, SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance type stuff where this sort of QC and variant information is quite important. Um, but if you have something functioning already, that's even better. Um, if you have an idea as to what we can extract and how we can extract it, if you dump it in an issue um, and then we can have a look at it. I mean, you know, pull request you know, contributions are always welcome as well. Um, um, but yeah, any suggestions or, or contributions like that would, would be, you know, more than welcome. And we, yeah, we can. I don't, I don't see why we can't dump a generic sort of QC flat file type thing. Um, but I think you can export some of that from Mod QC already. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe I can chime in there. Um, so uh, multi-QC by default will export all tables um, and quite a lot more into flat files specifically for this reason for downstream analysis. So uh, if you look in your multi-QC folder, there's the HTML report, but you'll also find the folder called multi-QC multi data. And inside there, there'll be a whole bunch of files and you can choose what format to have those in as well. Yep. In fact, that's what I'm parsing for Viorecon. I'm, I'm MultiQC dumps all of these files, and it's just really easy not to have a write another parser for every tool that has a log file because MultiQC is awesome and it does it for you. So I just literally um, get all of the information from those tables that MultiQC generates, parse it, and then use that to generate the QC metrics um, that are reported for Viorecon, for example. And I've been meaning to do something similar for RNA seq, but I just I, I haven't had the time. Thank you, Phil, uh, for chipping in. I don't know if there's anyone who has a question would like to unmute. But if it is in the case, um, thank you, Hashil, for the splendid review and answering the questions quite well. I guess we'll see each other. We'll see everyone in the next bite-sized talk next Tuesday. Awesome. Thanks, guys.